All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're getting ready to get started. I can get the... Uh Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the regular meeting, City Hall, April 18th, 2023, 430. Uh, we're going to begin with the invocation and pledge of allegiance, and I'm going to turn it over to Commissioner Melinda Hill. Thank you. If you will stand, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray today for our city commissioners, city management, and the citizens of our wonderful city. We ask that you be with each of the commissioners as we make tough decisions for the community we call home. Give us guidance as we make these decisions and cover our citizens with a hedge of protection. Let us not put first our own personal interest, but let us put forth the best interest of this community. In your name we pray, amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you, everybody. Uh, just want to say we haven't officially up here said congratulations to Warren Central High School for winning the state championship. We have invited them, Coach Unseld, to come here. Commissioner uh, Carlos Bailey reminded me, both alma maters from Warren Central High School. I'm a little bit older than you, Carlos, sorry. <laughs> but we will try to get them here. But we, nonetheless, that is an incredible feat. Um, we're very proud of that team and their journey to win the Sweet 16 in Bowling Green, Kentucky, for Bowling Green, Kentucky, and uh, what that means to our community and our state. Um, Carlos, you want to say anything of that? Just being a dragon, you know, no matter what school would have won, even if it was a purple or uh, hey, no. <laughs> but I was a purple and a dragon, so, you know, it, it didn't matter. But to shine a spotlight on Bowling Green, Kentucky is something huge, especially, you know, for the children that go to Warren Central. Uh, I'm a product of Warren Central and uh, of the Dragons, and I'm proud of product of Warren Central Dragons. And it's a huge, tremendous um, thing that those kids have done. And so congratulations to the Warren Central School and their team. That's it. Mrs. Jackson, will you please provide a roll call? Commissioner Bailey. Here. Commissioner Beasley Brown. Here. Commissioner Hill. Here. Commissioner Perigen, who is absent, and Mayor Alcott. Here. Mr. Meisel, do you have comments you'd like to make at this time? I have several, Your, Your Honor, if you give me just a few minutes. Uh, first of all, I want to remind anyone in the audience wanting to make public comments uh, after the regular uh, agenda is up, uh, please sign the register in the back of the room and we'll get to, you though, get to those right after the uh, regular agenda. Uh, I have a couple of uh, uh, accomplishments I want to um, uh, mention tonight. Uh, recently, um, our own uh, Chief Delaney uh, completed a master's degree, and uh, uh, very proud of him for doing that. We had a uh, another uh, battalion chief, Doug Morris, to complete his bachelor's degree in fire investigation. Very proud of that. And uh, our own Aaron Holsey, a recent com recently completed the uh, John Maxwell certification. So she is now a certified uh, Maxwell leadership uh, trainer. So very, very proud to announce that as well. And then lastly, least, last but not least, our own uh, uh, BGPD officer, Dale Barbier, was named the state's crisis intervention team officer of the year at a recent uh, Kentucky crisis intervention team conference in E-Town. And uh, that is a very high honor. It's, uh, he, is, uh, he got that award for his work in responding to emergencies uh, involving people with mental illness and, and trauma. And very proud of Dale for, for achieving that and, and receiving that, uh, that award. Uh, finally, 
Um, just a couple weeks ago, sadly, we lost uh, two of our dear city employees um, all in one week within a span of five, five days. And I, I want to say a few words about those two individuals. Uh, the first one um, was Jeff Salings. He was a operations maintenance technician in our public works operations division. Uh, he had advanced to an OMT2 and later promoted to uh, signal technician one in our operations division. He, he oversaw all of the city street lights, made sure they were properly functioning, which is a critical job and uh, we lost him uh, recently, um, all, all very suddenly. Uh, he, he worked, began his career with the city in 2007 and, and served for 16 years. Secondly, uh, Tammy Phelps. Uh, Tammy Phelps passed away just a few weeks ago. Um, Tammy was our paralegal in our, our law division uh, Tammy started the city in 2003 uh, when we brought uh, law in-house uh, with attorney Jean Harmon. Um, she was uh, approaching 20 years of service and a uh, very active member of Kentucky Paralegal Association, Southern Kentucky Association of Paralegals. Uh, both these individuals were just top-notch people all around and very dedicated employees for the city. Um, so I would like for us to, to, to have a moment of silence for, for both these two and their families that are, um, that are hurting right now still. So, um, excuse me. So let's, let's have a moment of silence for, for these two employees. Lord, we just want to thank you for Jeff and Tammy, all that they meant to our work family and our city, all that they did throughout their careers, devoted to this city and making it better. We ask that you bless their families, give them peace and comfort during this time as they, as they grieve and they mourn. And we just ask that you, your hand be on them. And all these things we pray in your name. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Meisel. The accolades as well, um, our city employees, we uh, appreciate your continued education, your accolades that you bring back and reflect great credit upon our community and your continued work that we have hired professionals that work within our city. So thank you for that, Mr. Meisel. Our first agenda item is approval of minutes or regular meeting uh, March 21st, 2023. So moved. Uh, moved by Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner Bailey. Uh, any discussion at this time? None. Roll call, please. Bailey? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Hill? Yes. Alcott? Yes. Municipal order number 2023 64. Municipal order approving the promotions of Michael Chambliss and Hannah Whitson to the position of police officer in the police department. So moved. Second. Moved by Commissioner Beasley Brown, second by Commissioner Bailey, Mr. Meisel. We have uh, several items on the agenda tonight uh, for for hires. Uh, these first three items I'm going to kind of uh, merge together. They're all uh, pertaining to the police department. Uh, the first one is uh, our police cadets. Two, we 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 created this position so we'd have a, a stepping stone uh, uh, position that we could step right in these these to the uh, police officer position. So we've got two of those, and then I'm gonna ask Aaron to come up, introduce those, and then next we've got uh, some new police officers that we would like to, uh, to, to pull in and hire. And then lastly, we have a, uh, a promotion uh, appointment uh, to communications uh, dispatcher position. So Aaron, would you like to come up and introduce these, these recommendations? 
Sure. So I'm going to be standing up here for um, several items. It's pretty exciting at night tonight. I'd like to give a lot of credit to our HR managers, Lori Gray and Tiara Britt, who are um, busy off doing recruiting activities. And so um, that's why you're seeing me here tonight instead of them. But I did want to mention, and this was kind of exciting, I just found this out yesterday, but every year WKU students vote on the best of the hill and um, wanted to just note that uh, the city of Bowling Green was the number one employment opportunity opportunity um, that was voted on by WKU students. So um, they're obviously connecting um, and, and we'll see lots of WKU graduates um, here tonight. So um, combining kind of uh, these, these first three, but um, the first two I would like to talk about is going to be uh, class five of the BGLEA. And um, so the first two are going to be promotions, Michael Chambliss and Hannah Whitson, if you would like to stand. You just saw them um, maybe about six weeks ago, two months ago. And uh, maybe as a reminder to you, but as well as the public, we recruit for police officer year round. Um, but we don't want the fact that we only have an academy once or twice a year to hold up the fact that we want to hire these people. So we've added to our pay classification schedule a full time position of police cadet two. And that is what we appointed Hannah and Michael to um, about two months ago. And, and they've been f working in a full time position learning the inner workings of the police department waiting for an academy to start. So if anybody is interested in being a police officer with the city of Bowling Green, you don't have to wait for a class to begin or that big push. You can apply anytime and we will hire you potentially into a full-time position to get started. Um, in addition to that, we have um, two cadet ones. Those are either part-time positions, um, Kaylee Allen and Erica Echeverria. And I would like to ask them to stand. Um, so they've been with us as cadet ones in the part-time capacity as they are going to school and, and doing other things and then they have applied to be a police officer and they just went through our recent interview panel. And then also adding to class five is Andrea Keating, Jackson Miller, and Jennifer Pierce all with us here tonight. So very excited. And then um, the third item, of course, is um, also during our interviews, we interviewed um, Kylie Powell, um, very impressive young lady. She went to EKU, we're not gonna hold that against her, um, but Kylie, if you could stand as well, is gonna join our dispatch team. So very excited for all these individuals to join our police department and um, soon go through academies. So please let me know if you have any questions on these three items. I have one question, Erin. Did they bring any family with them tonight? Some of them did. <laughs> um, probably not all, but um, if Well, how can... about we just start here and introduce your family, Mr. Jackson. All right, thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Okay, right here in front. Thank you. Well, right here. Go this way. All right. We'll we'll be your family tonight. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay, I understand. Okay. All right. Well, in a minute, you're about to be part of our extended family. Oh, I'm. There. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, welcome family tonight and commissioners. Uh, let's see what we can do to employ, make some employment tonight. All right. So we just go on the first order. All right, Mrs. Jackson. A. Lee. Yes. <clears throat> Beasley Brown. Yes. Hill. Yes. Alcott. Yes. Congratulations, Michael and Hannah. So. <clears throat> and then we've introduced the employees, but the next two orders are Municipal Order Number 2023-65. Municipal Order approving probationary appointments of Kaylee Allen, Erica Echeverria, 
Andrea Keating, Jackson Miller, and Jennifer Pierce to the position of police officer in the police department. So move. Second. Moved by Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner Bailey. Roll call, please. Bailey. Yes. Beasley Brown. Yes. Hill. Yes. Alcott. Yes. Congratulations. Now, Municipal Order Number 2023-66. Municipal Order approving the probationary appointment of Kylie Powell to the position of Communications Dispatcher 1 in the Police Department. So moved. Second. Moved by Commissioner Beasley Brown, second by Commissioner Hill. Roll call, please. Bailey. Yes. Beasley Brown. Yes. Hill. Yes. Alcott. Yes. Congratulations, Kylie. All right. Thank you, everybody. So the meeting is going to be about three hours tonight. You're all welcome to stay <laughs> or you're welcome to go celebrate with your family. So thank you, everybody. We're going to stay put until after all seven are done, if you don't okay. mind. All right. We're going to stay until all seven and then we'll, oh, we'll kind of exit together. So. Thanks. All right, Municipal Order Number 2023-67. Municipal Order approving the probationary appointments of Dustin Davis and Hunter Woods to the position of Operations Technician 1 in the Public Works Department. So moved. Second. Moved by Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner Beasley-Brown. Aaron. Great, so we have, um, we had two openings for OMT1. Both of them were due to resignations. Um, this is part of a career path program, as you know. Um, OMT1s can uh, go through a job book and be promoted to OMT2, OMT3, and possibly crew leader and crew supervisor. We received applications, and they were all reviewed by the department, and we interviewed four individuals. Uh, the interview panel decided to recommend Hunter Woods and Dustin Davis. Um, neither could make it with us tonight, um, but uh, information is there in the memo for you, and please let me know if you have any questions. Questions? No questions? All right, roll call, please. Bailey? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Hill? Yes. Alcott? Yes. Congratulations to Dustin and Hunter. So. Municipal Order Number 2023-68. Municipal Order approving the probationary appointment of Christy Montgomery to the position of paralegal in the law department. So moved. Second. Moved by Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner Beasley-Brown. Aaron. All right, so we are looking for a recommendation to uh, appoint a paralegal. Um, I do want to briefly explain that mid-year we did make a decision to add a second paralegal to our staff um, to work alongside and learn with Tammy. And so we were in a recruitment process. Tammy was part of the selection. Um, and so that kind of, I just want to explain a little bit the, the quickness, what may seem, this is not a replacement of, of Tammy. This was something previously planned. Um, we will spend some time, Hillary and Christy, working together um, before we select that, that second paralegal. Um, so that was, that was kind of the situation. No, this is an add to staff um, as, as we continue to have more, more things in the legal department that Hillary needs some assistance with. We had uh, received 18 applications and 12 were reviewed with some experience and we interviewed four candidates. Um, we uh, are recommending Christy Montgomery. She's with us tonight. If you could stand, please. Um, so Christy has a bachelor's degree in political science and sociology with a minor in criminology and a certificate in paralegal studies from WKU. She comes to us from the Simpson firm, but the really neat thing is that she has worked previously with the city of Bowling Green as a communications dispatcher for 14 years. So we're super excited to welcome Christy back to the Bowling Green family. Ashley, thank you, Erin. Christy, did you bring family with you? Well, welcome back to our family. Happy to have you. All right, commissioners, roll call. Bailey? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Hill? Yes. Alcott? Yes. Congratulations, Christy. <laughs> Municipal Order Number 2023-69. Municipal Order approving the probationary appointment of Kirsten Homer to the position of Benefits Coordinator in the Human Resources Department. Move. Second. Second. By Commissioner Bailey, second by Commissioner Beasley Brown, Aaron. Right, so we had a resignation in the Human Resources Office for our benefits coordinator. This is a position that was created last year. Um, we had 55 applications received and we reviewed all of those. 
and um, we decided to interview seven. It was Lori Gray and I on the interview panel, and we selected Kirsten Homer for the position, if you would like to stand. Um, she also has a bachelor's degree from WKU, and um, for the last year, she has been an HR assistant for Cabelco Aluminum. So we're really excited to welcome her to the city of Bowling Green and the HR department. Family? All right, well, we'll take care of that. <laughs> All right, roll call, please. Bailey? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Hill? Yes. Alcott? Yes. Congratulations, Kirsten. <laughs> Municipal Order Number 2023-70. Municipal Order approving the probationary appointment of Zachary Powers to the position of Systems Analyst 1 in the Information Technology Department. So moved. Second. Moved by Commissioner Beasley Brown, second by Commissioner Hill. Aaron. We had a resignation in the IT department for a systems analyst. We received 10 applications and we interviewed six candidates and uh, we'd like to recommend Zachary Powers as um, our new systems analyst. He's here with us tonight. And um, there's some information about him, but I do want to recommend, I love stories, you know that, they all kind of come full, full circle. We all know Zach, he has been um, our RICO representative, so he comes in and out of our offices all the time, assisting and serving us already, so already kind of feels part of the family. Um, so we're excited to make it official. All right, Zachary, do you have anyone with you tonight? Yes, uh, my partner is Scott Payne and my dad, Nick Ross. Very nice, thank you. All right, let's make this official, commissioners. Roll call, please. Bailey? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Hill? Yes. Alcott? Yes. Congratulations, Zachary. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Uh, family, friends, If at this time, if you'd like to go celebrate, um, you're welcome to exit. Yeah, we're going to give you a, a minute here. No one wants to stay. I think we Linda, I can go over there and just get an audience to come back real quick. All right, next on the agenda is Municipal Order Number 2023-71. Excuse me, Municipal Order authorizing and accepting bid number 2023-48 for fire department equipment from various vendors in the total amount not to exceed $200,000. So move. Second. Moved by Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner Bailey. Mr. Meisel. In the uh, annual budget, we, we budget for roughly $200,000 uh, for public safety supplies, loose equipment, safety items for the fire department. And the way we go about purchasing these is we want to get the best deal there is. So we can't lock in with one vendor. Uh, there's so, so many multiple vendors that supply multiple things. So the, the way this was brought about, this started several years ago, and I really, really like the idea is we go out and we uh, approach, we do an RFP and request bids for every single item that we purchase and several companies bid on these and we tell them to give give us a bid uh, based on a discount of the msrp or man the suggested retail price and so we went out for bid and uh we, we ended up with uh let's see one two three four five six seven different companies that uh, won different awards for different items and so in your packets are a list of those items and the uh, companies that were uh, given the award for those, those items. So uh, 
recommend going with these uh, recommendations, these seven companies. Uh, Battalion Chief uh, Doug Morris is here, can answer any questions you might have. And uh, we recommend uh, this municipal order uh, be adopted tonight uh, to, to be able to, to purchase these items from these companies as needed. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Meisel. Commissioners, do you have any questions at this time? I will. One more thing, Mayor. I'm sorry. I will note in your packets that it, anytime there's a, an asterisk beside uh, the the item, that means it's awarded to more than one company, and two asterisks means it's received. Uh, they receive partial product group awards. So, just wanted to note that. Mr. Meisel, questions? questions roll call please Bailey yes. Beasley Brown yes Hill yes Alcott yes municipal order number 2023-72 municipal order authorizing accepting a proposal from MKSK Inc of Louisville Kentucky related to a request for qualifications for engineering and design services for the Riverfront Park project bid number 2023-17 in an amount not to exceed $408,000 $408,600 so moved Second. Moved by Commissioner Beasley Brown, second by Commissioner Bailey. Mr. Meisel. As you all know, uh, our riverfront uh, park development is going to be, I'm not sure how to say it, but uh, our focal focus for, for several years, uh, it's going to be our marquee um, project coming up. And so we went out for proposals uh, and we got 10 and we, we we looked over all 10 of those and, and decided to interview eight. And we, we sat down over several days. It was uh, Katie, Brent Childers, Brent Belcher, Melissa Kanzler helped us out. Nick Cook was in the room and myself. And we kind of hunkered down for a couple days there in the public works uh, uh, conference room and went through these proposals. We invited all, we invited eight of them. We gave them, what, an hour, hour and a half to, to, to uh, propose or give their presentation. From there, we narrowed that down to four. We called those back in for two hour interviews and, and, and kind of questioned them and uh, got down to the final couple. And we have on your, your, your packet here recommending MKSK. Uh, they're a pretty big firm. They've, they're in 12 different states and have an office in Louisville that we would be working with. And they uh, would be providing us with a phase, I'm sorry, a master plan for the, the whole, both sides of the park, along with a construction, uh, engineering design and construction for phase one. Phase one uh, would pertain to the grant we got, the $750,000 from the uh, ORLP grant uh, with our $1.5 million match for the 2.25 total. Uh, we, would, we would most likely focus on the landfill side first. And uh, so they're going to provide us with a plan, master plan for all of it in construction for the, the if you're facing the river now, it would be the left side and uh, come back to us for, uh, with with all of that in the amount of $408,600. Uh, we have uh, the 2.25 set aside uh, to get, get started on this and uh, are recommending that we uh, hire MKSK for the design work on this. Brent Childers is here. If you have any questions, uh, Brent Belcher, I think, could make it tonight, but uh, we can try to answer any questions you might have on this. I have one question. Um, I'm so excited we're making progress on this Riverfront Park, and uh, I was reading through their proposal. I mentioned, I saw that they are going to be here meetings, um, but it didn't spe specify any public meetings, and so I wasn't sure if that's this phase or. Oh, that is absolutely this phase. Okay. And that was one of the big components as we went through the, the, the process was that uh, the public engagement part and so really that master planning part is really what that purpose is to come up with what is the vision for this park and having the public engage in that and so I've been working with them on how do we want that to look like uh, what does that how do we want that engagement to be they brought another firm in to assist as a sub consultant uh, as part of their engagement for this uh, that's also done some other work in the area and some other mass urban design planning in the area so they're familiar with Bowling Green 
Uh, so we're excited to really kick that off uh, because once you get that final vision down on paper, then it just comes down to designing and implementing phases of that over time. And we recognize uh, phase one is just the start. Phase two will soon there follow, uh, but there will be a day where somebody will stand before this group or another group like it and say, well, we're here, we're here for phase 20 of this park. And uh, that's, that's really what we're doing today is, is kickstarting that for a future generation to continue to invest in this, in this new type of park that has not existed in our domain, in our community. And as we try to build this regional destination park, uh, you know, it's a new concept. We're trying to push, push, push for, you know, how do we create this talent attraction type park for our community? And we're very excited to work with MKSK. We're excited to get this started. I was just clarifying with Nick. Uh, there was a group of us that sat down and Nick wrote the first grant re application in 2016 uh, to really kind of start this project and that was seven years ago and now we're finally hiring a designer uh, to put this project into action. So these things do take slow, they do take a long time, but we are committed to making sure that we do this right and do this right for the community and for the future generations. Well, I know our community is really excited about it as well. So should uh, folks just be watching social media? Is there a way they can sign up to get alerts on how to Social media will be the involved? main way. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll be fine tuning what that process looks like. So that's all I have at this point. Okay. Uh, but social media will be the main way. But that is one of the major tenets of, of how we wanted to go about this was having that public engagement on that front end. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All right. Thank Thank you, section section uh, 2.3 uh, starts it talks a little bit about the public engagement in, in the, the contract that follows the, the uh, municipal order and memo. Thank you very much. Roll call, please. Bailey? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Hill? Yes. Alcott? Yes. Municipal order number 2023-73. Municipal order authorizing and accepting bid number 2023-43 for lowered floor wheelchair accessible vans with side mobility access ramp from Creative Bus Sales Inc. of Indianapolis, Indiana in an amount not to exceed $432,345. Second. Second. Moved by Commissioner Bailey, seconded by Commissioner Hill. Mr. Meisel. Back in February, we issued the request for proposals uh, for these low floor vans. We only received one uh, response that was from the Creative Bus Sales uh, Inc. Uh, company. And uh, we based this on references, 25%, uh, 50% uh, of it was cost. And then the other 25% criteria was, was based on the available inventory and timeline for delivery. And so uh, they scored, of course, pretty, pretty well with the being only the only proposal. but. We feel good about them. Uh, this is going to be a not to exceed 432, 345 cost. This is all FTA grant money, no city money involved here. And uh, very excited about getting these uh, low floor buses that will be very, a lot more easy to get on and off uh, around the city. And Brent and Nick are here, can answer any questions on this one. Thank you, Mr. Muzzle. Commissioners? Just like to say, Mayor, um, this item and the next three items on the agenda were either approving a purchase for an agency or were awarding business to a business in this town. It always makes me feel so good when these agencies show up or these businesses show up to show their support. You don't assume that we're going to vote yes that you take time from your busy schedules to show up tonight. I know you have a lot better things you could do. But all for the next agenda items, you know who I'm talking about. So thank you so much for being here tonight. And it's an honor to get to vote for these. Thank you. Dana? Uh, yeah, I just had a question around, because in the memo it mentions expansion and just or continuing service as normal. So just wondering if this is going to be a, a new route, because I feel like the public might wonder that, or if it's just you know making sure we have healthy vehicles to allow us to continue service as usual. Um, it is not a new route there in addition to the vehicles or the fleet that we have now uh, It's just a different type of vehicle that allows us to use it on two divisions that we currently have in operation um, So it's currently available so we can grab those as soon as we can improve that Thanks so much For Being here as well to answer questions Roll call, please Bailey. Yes. Beasley Brown. Yes. Hill. Yes. Alcott. Yes. 
Municipal Order Number 2023-75. 74. 74. Muni Sorry. Municipal Order authorizing a contract through non-competitive negotiations with Live the Dream Development, Inc. of Bowling Green, Kentucky for Census Block Group 102.1 Exterior Property Improvements Program in the amount of $400,000. So moved. Second. Second. Moved by Commissioner Beasley-Brown, seconded by Commissioner Hill. Mr. Meisel. So for several years now, we have set aside money uh, for our neighborhood improvement program. I believe this one here would be our fourth area um, that we are going to go into and try to improve uh, the, the, the neighborhood. And so uh, we have a good partnership with Live the Dream and uh, we have uh, discussed this and entered, to, entered into an agreement with them. Uh, for, with this 400,000 to manage this for us. We think we can improve 47 properties with this uh, in the uh, census block 102.1. Um, Brand or Nick may have to get up and explain where this is gonna be, but um, uh, Live the Dream will be paid a, a $1,000 admin fee per property to manage this. And uh, we're gonna be able to cover up to $7,500 exterior renovations for homeowners, uh, any landlords or businesses that, that own property, uh, they would put up a 20% uh, contribution. Landlords for businesses would be 50% for commercial property. But uh, excited to get this uh, going, $400,000 uh, for, we think, can cover up to 47 properties. Um, Brent, can you explain the 102.1, kind of give us a or is there a map in here? I apologize. I don't think there is. We've talked about think, it several times. Okay. It would be the lower downtown area from the railroad tracks uh, up to about 8th Street, all the way back around to Fairview Bypass. So it will come up the hill just a, just a bit, but it's primarily going to be Medical Center, Shake Rag, uh, this mid-downtown around Circus Square, uh, and that's our 1021 uh, where, it, where it breaks uh, over to the railroad tracks. Any other questions? Uh, one note I will say, in the past we've done this at 5000 uh, just with the cost and the increases. We felt like we need to, uh, we weren't getting as much as we, whenever we started this several years ago, and so we did increase it up to 7500 uh, just so people could get more, I guess, uh, more investment kind of back to where we were several years ago. So we did make an increase from the traditional 5000 up to 7500 just the costs were too, too much. Good question. Um, would you explain to our community sort of the goal of this program, how it doesn't just benefit the, um, you know, resident or homeowner, but just how so, that community impact that it has? Yeah. So really the goal for this is you think about an overall improvement to the neighborhood. Uh, and so whenever we developed this program several years ago in and around our office area, 105.2, uh, the thought was if we can improve the overall aesthetics of the neighborhood, then the entire neighborhood is increased. And there's, there's value to that. And so we focused in, in on exterior improvements. So this is a way for property owners, whether it be a homeowner, a landlord, a business, to receive a rebate assistance from uh, through Live the Dream uh, from the city uh, to make improvements to their property. So and it could be uh, some of the big improvements that we've seen are things that aren't code violations. They're maintenance issues, but they're costly. I mean, we can recall of a, of a property in our first neighborhood that had this huge tree that just was too much for that property owner to take on. This would have been a probably thirteen to $2,000 removal, uh, but that tree really needed to go. Uh, and we helped take that tree out. And now they were able to plant some appropriate things, redo the railing on the front porch. It just changed the overall look and aesthetics of that single property, thereby increasing the property values and the equity that that person has in that home that's returned. The other side of this is what, uh, what I call the neighborhood peer pressure effect uh, that we saw several times is as three or four houses on a street started to make these improvements, uh, the other four or five houses start looking around and going, okay, now we need to make an improvements with assistance or without assistance. Uh, the other thing that we saw is, yes, people went up to the maximum to, to get the rebate. Uh, and then they go, well, you know what? I need to do a couple more thousand dollars. So I went ahead and did these other two or three projects. And so what we saw was people really kickstarting an investment back into their neighborhoods, back into their properties. And this wasn't because the government said you have to do this through a code enforcement action. This was really more of a, uh, this is an opportunity to improve the neighborhood by 
also improving my individual property. So we're excited about this. Every neighborhood we go to, uh, this is one of the things we hear about. Uh, and so we've kind of developed this program and fine tuning. We appreciate the partnership with Live the Dream over the years to run it, because as you can imagine, administratively, uh, there is quite a bit that goes into it, but also so appreciate the support of the city commission and of uh, Jeff and Katie that continue to have fund this program so that we can do this for the neighborhoods and do this for the neighbors so we can make these improvements and these long-term commitments uh, to the neighborhoods. Anything else? I know y'all got a lot to talk about tonight, so. Thank you, Brent. Thank you all. All right, no further discussion. Roll call, please. Lee. Yes. Beasley Brown. Yes. Hill. Yes. Alcott. Yes. Municipal order number 2023-75. In this order authorizing and accepting the number 2023-38 for Green Hill Street Extension Professional Services from Commonwealth Engineers, Inc. of Bowling Green, Kentucky in the amount of $68,500. So moved. Second. Actually, everybody, mm -hmm. but I'll give it to a uh, motion by Beasley Brown, second by Carlos Bailey. Sorry. Um, right, no, didn't so, say Mr. Meisel. It's okay. It? <laughs> I, I, get, I got it. Uh, Green Hill Street is a stub street out in the Whispering Hills subdivision. Uh, it's, it's roughly 50 years old, and, and we, we were looking at this, uh, Public Works was, I give uh, engineering a lot of credit on this, is a good opportunity. Uh, we would we, we've been looking at this, and we think we connect it, we can connect it up uh, with the Veterans Memorial uh, Boulevard and uh, extend it out. It's right now, it's a stub street that stops uh, along the edge of, uh, of the veterans. And so uh, we can add roughly uh, 2,100 feet, get it connected with veterans, uh, put a, a, a traffic light up and provide them with another uh, exit out of Whispering Hills. As, as you know, we've discussed the the challenge of go making a left-hand turn out of the main entrance of Whispering Hills onto Russell Road. Uh, this would give them another outlet uh, out of that neighborhood onto veterans and uh, they could go left or right at this light that we would align across from the, the new development Keystone Commons there and uh, close to Spring Hill subdivision. So uh, Public Works went out for bid uh, for, for professional services and for, for design, and we've got four uh, bids that came in, and this was an evaluated bid, so it wasn't strictly low cost, and the evaluated bids, we are recommending Commonwealth engineers at uh, a, a price tag of $68,500 to do the, the scope of work and the design for this project. Um, it would also address, uh, you know, anything pertaining to Jennings Creek and all, all that runs through there, and, uh, take care of any flood plain regulations all of that so melissa Kanzler, our city engineer is with us can answer any questions on this project but we think this is going to be a great uh, traffic mitigation pro uh, project in that area for whispering hills in that neighborhood and connect them to where they can get out onto veterans a lot easier and uh would we'll be glad to try to answer any questions you might have on this one all right thank you mr meisel commissioners um, yes, I'm super excited for this neighborhood. I know they have been um, needing this for such a long time. Uh, this, ever since I was first became a commissioner, uh, this was brought to our attention, and um, just how difficult it is to get out there on Russellville Road, especially um, you know during rush hour. So I'm just so grateful that uh, Public Works really does you know work really hard to solve these problems for our neighborhoods. Um, and then secondly, I was just curious about this is uh, the I think we approved maybe at our last meeting the meetings run uh, together about the greenway to connect is this that point where also a greenway will come through here or is that a different location nick he left but um there is a greenway the creekwood greenway ends on green hills uh, so we would incorporate a multi-use path along this connection and take it over to veterans where you know we have that along there uh, the goal is to continue that across through the keystone uh, neighborhood and up to connect to spring hill and then ultimately over to the walmart stonehenge area so that is a project that's up for hopefully applying for a grant. Uh, we applied once. We're going to try. Applied it. We've applied again. Uh, we're hopeful, though. We, we do get a little credit when we already have something underway and under design that maybe we can build on. Hopefully, that'll give our, um, our project a little bit more chance this time. Thank so. you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Melissa. 
All right, no further discussion. Roll call, please. Bailey? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Hill? Yes. Alcott? Yes. Municipal Order Number 2023-76. Municipal Order approving recommendation from the Bowling Green Area Convention and Visitors Bureau to distribute an amount up to $75,000 of transient room taxes to the Kentucky Museum. We'll move. Second. Moved by Commissioner Bailey, second by Commissioner Hill. Mr. Meisel. So, uh, as you all probably know, of the uh, the transit room taxes that come in for the uh, hotel adjacent hotel adjacent to the convention center Holiday Inn, uh, that creates a special fund for CVB to distribute for tourism related projects. So, tonight uh, Sherry Murphy is here with CVB to recommend a a project uh, to it for the use of this this fund these funds seventy five thousand dollars and I'd like to ask Sherry Murphy to come up and, and make her recommendation everyone <clears throat> excuse me I'm battling allergies as some of you are as well as so far as what I've heard um, as Jeff had described, we do set aside some of the transit room tax that goes into a special tourism projects fund. And from time to time, we have larger projects come before us. They, they come before our board first, and then we approve, and then we go before fiscal court and, of course, the city commission uh, to ask for approval. And once they pass those three steps, um, we then work with the project and help promote it once it gets going. Um, I've invited uh, Brent to come with me tonight. He has all the answers, so ask questions, please. Whereas I could probably tell you just a snippet of, of the, the project that he has in mind. And it is a pretty cool project, so I think you'll enjoy hearing about it. Hello, Mayor. Hello, Commissioners. Um, I'm Brent Bjorkman. I'm the director of the Kentucky Museum and the Kentucky Folklife Program on the campus at WKU. For the last five years, well, the museum is really all about a town gown bridge. It's what we see our role in in this university to talk about the art history and culture of, of not just the Commonwealth, but really of South Central Kentucky. <clears throat> Excuse me. So over the last five years, we've been doing lots of oral histories. That's one of the ways we engage and create our projects. And we are uh, proposing, and we're very thankful for the, uh, the CBB because they've been a proponent of this as they've seen it mature over time. Doing oral histories with musicians, with record store owners, with small independent recording studios, talking about the history of different venues in our place. We're so close to Nashville, but Bowling Green, especially by musicians and people who love music, know it is a very different kind of animal. So we're proposing, we've created a, an exhibit called um, Music Legacy of South Central Kentucky. I think in the packet you've got that link and you've, you know a little bit about what we've been proposing. We're stepping up from that now to propose a physical exhibit that would be installed at the Kentucky Museum's first gallery space when you walk in, 7,000 square feet, for the fall of 2024. This is a conceptualization time right now. We're hiring different people. We're talking to our friends at the Country Music Hall of Fame. We're envisioning lots of things like sound showers where you can hear people. Everybody from celebrating everybody from Ernest Hogan, the father of ragtime, who was born in Shake Rag, to Cage the Elephant with Sam Bush in between there. The Hilltoppers, a doo-wop group that went put WKU on the map. Nappy Roots back in the back in the 1990s, late 80s, 1990 into the 1990s. <clears throat> So it's gonna be talking about that. It's gonna be talking about the Quonset Hut. It's gonna be talking about these historical places, how we're the crossroads of America in a lot of ways. So we see that really, and I'm thankful for the CVB to really understand that this can be a real economic driver as well as honoring and validating all these intimate voices um, that have been performing, that have went on to do great things, but also some of those people that have stayed around. And we also have a great group of young musicians who we hope will be inspired by this as well. We also see lots of ancillary things coming about, small concerts at the museum, but also I think uh, Capitol Theater. There's a lot of great energy from, um, everyone I talk to is very enthused about this. So we're really happy to bring this to fruition and happy to, ask for funds and, and ask you to put your blessing on this as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just have like a comment just really quick. 
the Quonset Hut, it, Nappy Root, some of those guys are my friends. They were actually in the late, late 90s. One of the guys, Ron, That's what actually I meant. Sorry. used to cut my hair. And Vito, who's from Bowling Green, Kentucky. V, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he went to school with us. But the Quonset Hut, just these things are important to our community, the history of it and stuff that we don't learn about. Because I never knew until I did posted something back in February about the Quonset Hut where we had like Tina Turner, some like the, I think, it has on here Ray Charles, but a lot of those histories that was there, and they would stay at the Southern Queen. Queen, Southern Queen, at the, yeah. At the time, because they couldn't go anywhere. So learning these things, Lamont Pearly is like one of my good friends mm -hmm. who's a part of the folklore. Yeah, yeah he's um, one of our students in the program that I'm a faculty on, he, yeah. He's good on learning those things from yeah. New York, but these things teaching, it shouldn't go away, and it teaches the future generation of what Bowling Green actually was back in the day. Because one thing that I even learned about the Quonset Hut, even during the height, before the Civil Rights Movement took place in the 60s, they had certain venues where whites and blacks actually used to co-mingle. And those stories need to be told because it pushes our, our community forward, but it also lets people know what Bowling Green was back then so we know what we are today. So. You can come and write some text for me then. <laughs> For the exhibit. Yeah, I mean, coming from Chicago on a Saturday night, and they're going to play in Montgomery Tuesday night. Yeah. They know that they know about the Quonset Hut. So, you know, James Brown and Ray Charles and Turner. Tina Turner. Absolutely. Mahalia Jackson. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to tell that story and infuse it with modern day voices as well. So it's the whole, whole thing, the whole ecosystem, musical ecosystem. And the timing is perfect with um, the Southern Queen uh, getting renovated, and also we have the new alleyway. Is it called Music Row or Music Alley? The one on the side we had talked about. Got it. But just excited about sort of these things aligning where we you know, can bring folks downtown with some things that are in the works. So I'm hopeful we can all work together to connect all those things because it's really exciting. Thank you so much for your work on this. Absolutely. Thank you all. Brett, thank you very much. Okay, it's exciting things happening, um, celebration of our folklore, and also a plug for our Kentucky Museum that's right here at WKU, a very special place um, to our community. All right, roll call, please. Bailey? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Hill? Yes. Alcott? Yes. All right. Municipal Order Number 2023-77. Municipal Order approving and authorizing the mayor to execute a vehicle leasing agreement with BGFA Charities, Inc. for the lease of a 2023 red Corvette coupe in the amount of $1. So moved. Second. Moved by Commissioner Beasley Brown, second by Commissioner Hill. Mr. Mazel. Back by popular demand. Uh, this is uh, Corvette Number 2. I, I believe it's already here, right, Doug? Uh, this is uh, another same same setup. I think it went very smoothly last year. Uh, just a dollar lease to the fire department to be able to promote uh, their brand and use it for uh, you know education and, and different things around the community. And then it will be auctioned off at the annual fireman's ball, and those proceeds will go back into the community to help a lot of people and they did a lot of great things with with that money last year it was incredible the uh, thanksgiving baskets the shop with the firefighter habitat for humanity on and on and so uh this has really been a, a great thing i uh, really want to thank the um the gentleman that, that gets us the, the corvette and able to to, to to nail that down each year and uh, be able to get this car in for us to uh, raffle, uh, for the firefighters to raffle off through their firefighters association and uh, give back to the community. Fantastic of this, what it did last year and the continued legacy, um, but it's also a celebration of our community and what we're about. And I'm proud of that you guys are continuing this work. Um, lost some money on it, but I didn't lose money because it went to good charity and good cause. So thank you. Good question. Do you know if it'll be the new EV Corvette? No, it, it's not. No, no, maybe next year. Yeah. <laughs> I like that horsepower personally, but. <laughs> All right, roll call, please. Bailey? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Hill? Yes. Alcott? Yes. Municipal Order Number 2023-78. Municipal Order approving construction and accepting maintenance of Autumn View subdivision. So moved. Second. 
Moved by Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner Beasley Brown. Mr. Meisel. We have a uh, subdivision autumn view out uh, Russell Road ready for acceptance into our, our city infrastructure, city assets. Uh, Melissa and her uh, her uh, group have been out to inspect it as well as Ben's team. Uh, it's uh, going to be 2,158 linear feet. That's about 0.4 miles of roadway along with sidewalk and stormwater. This is out uh, Russell Road again. Um, and everything looked okay. They went out in January, maybe found one or two things, but went back in March for a final and everything looks good and it's uh, ready to be accepted. Melissa can answer any questions you might have. Uh, ben Peterson here as well, so. Okay, thank you, Mr. Meisel. Commissioners? Roll call, please. Haley? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Hill? Yes. Alcott? Yes. Ordinance number BG 2023-6, first reading, non-binding. Ordinance amending code of ordinances. Ordinance amending chapter 18, occupational license, fees, and taxes of the city of Bowling Green code of ordinances to revise the occupational license fees. So move. Moved by Commissioner Hill, uh, second by myself, uh, Mr. Meisel. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I want to uh, go in and rehash everything that we uh, presented to you back on, uh, I believe it was February 21st at a work session but uh, i will would like to follow up on just a couple of things um, you all had asked the question what about all of the new jobs and revenue coming in with the new jobs uh, katie reached out to the chamber uh, we got uh, some numbers on that we we set we sent that to you i believe that uh, that total came to it was over a number of years but we did get a number uh, through 2029, we, we would be able to produce about $2.8 million additional revenue, uh, but that would kind of slowly ramp up between now and 2029 versus what we think we, we, we estimate $5 million uh, that would be produced by this 0.15 reset back to the 2%. Uh, just want to uh, hit a, a couple of different, just a couple of high points uh, as you recall I did mention there there are 34 other cities in Kentucky uh, that have a higher occupational tax rate than us and, and Bowling Green is this is the third largest city in Kentucky and the fastest growing but I just wanted to, to run through some names here uh, that have higher rates than, than Bowling Green it's uh, Dareville, Ashland, Bellevue, Berea, Burksville, Cave City, Covington, Danville, Dayton, Elkton, Florence, Frankfurt, Fulton, Hopkinsville, Jackson, Kentucky, Lexington, Ludlow, Kentucky, Mayfield, Maysville, Kentucky, Middlesboro, Midway, Morgantown, Kentucky, Mount Olivet, Kentucky, Richmond, Russellville, Southgate, Kentucky up in Campbell County, uh, Taylor Mill up in Kenton County, uh, Vine Grove in Hardin County, Wilder, Wilmore, Winchester, and Clark County. Those are uh, some of the 34, all of the 34 cities in, that are, they're all smaller than Bowling Green with an occupational tax higher than 1.85, that, that's the Bowling Green's current rate. As you recall, back in 2007, we did have a 2% a, a rate. Uh, we had adopted that in 2003 and uh, Another way to look at that was from 2003 to 2007, we were at 2%. We decided to, you could look at it as a discount. We decided to discount that 2% down to 1.85. That discount that we provided to the taxpayers over the last 15 years has produced about a $54 million discount overall to our city taxpayers since 2007. Um, last thing i want to mention is that the state did pass another state income tax reduction with during the general assembly that will take the kentucky withholding tax and income tax down to a four percent rate uh, we provided a little chart uh, for you to what the the impact of that would be you see all the red numbers here uh, with the state tax reduction I'm not talking to you, Siri, sorry. <laughs> um, 
with that state income tax reduction and with our small 0.15% increase, you're still looking at net savings of, uh, you know, s several dollars per paycheck, uh, as this shows. I think we sent that out on social media. Uh, Debbie sent that out to, to, to everyone. So uh, just want to, to bring all these points again to you tonight. And in closing, just want to say that this is not about us, not about me, not about Katie, not about our current leadership. This is about the future. This is about the future of Bowling Green, uh, what we're going to need, our population growth, uh, with population growth that creates more uh, demand for services. You all know the needs we have in all departments for, for personnel, especially our police and fire departments. And this uh, reset back to a rate that we had 15 years ago would be a tremendous help in sustaining and securing the financial health of this city. So I ask you for your support of this. We think it's the right time we think it's the right move at the right moment to, to, to do this. I would not have brought this to you if not for the state income tax reduction. Uh, but with that 1% reduction, we're only asking for a rate that we had 15 years ago and the economy is a lot different today with inflation. I don't wanna rehash all the things that have, we we're facing with the inflation and, and, and price pricing that's gone up, but again, what other entity or business has not raised their prices in the last 15 to 20 years? There's not one. We have not given ourselves a raise. So I come before you tonight making my final request that you all seriously consider this recommendation and I'll, I'll yield the floor. All right, commissioners, floor is open for discussion. Dana, any comments? None. Carlos? For me, I will com comment. The thing is, is like, we talk about like the taxes that were reduced by, I guess, our state government. What we don't talk about is also when they reduced that, they added certain fees to other areas because those legislators knew that they were gonna be losing money so when I look at this and I've heard stuff and they're like, well, do you not take your, your expertise seriously about what's going on? And I do. But the thing about it is I was never elected to be a rubber stamp. If I was elected to be a rubber stamp, I, w I shouldn't be here. I have to listen to the people. I have to listen to the elected officials. Then I have to also with myself not try to push my own religion, but pray on it and kind of figure out where I'm going to be at. So with that said, to me that there are currently many unfilled jobs in Bowling Green, Kentucky. As we've heard, it means that there's significant opportunity to generate revenue through employment taxes without raising the rate today. We heard a while ago is that it would raise it to almost 5.2 million that we would be getting through 2029, but it also will raise it, what we'll get is 2.8 million. So focus on filling these vacancies would not only generate more revenue, but it would also reduce the burden of the city budget by creating more taxpayers that we currently don't have. Some of those taxpayers are not here today because we know some of those jobs are not built through the, the battery plant, the, the glass plant. So we know once they get there, it's gonna have more revenue through the occupational taxes. It is important also to consider that the impact that a tax increase could have on the overall economic health of the city. And I agree with Mr. Meisel that we will have more money I only disagree is that I don't know if we need it at this time. Raises taxes could also lead to a decrease in consumer spending, a business investment, as individuals and companies look to cut costs. It ultimately can lead to a decrease in revenue and weakening the local economy because they feel like that they're not gonna go out to eat or they're gonna go somewhere else or stay in. Therefore, at this time, it would be more prudent for myself to focus on filling those job vacancies and increasing revenue through employment taxes rather than raising the occupational tax rate. So at this time, my vote is a no. All right, Melinda. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Commissioner Bailey. This is hard, but this, as people know, this is my fifth term in office. 
and always run to do what is best for our city. I will be supporting this. I don't view it as an increase. I view it as taking it back to what it was 15 years ago. I'm doing it for our future of the men and women in uniform, our first responders. I'm doing it for the future of our streets, the future of our sidewalks, the future of our parks. I'm doing it for the future of our city staff. I'm voting yes, and I will continue to vote yes, to make sure our city remains competitive and stays vibrant. I do not believe our city will continue as it is today without this increase. I view it as taking it back to what it once was 15 years ago. All right, thank you. Any other comments from commissioners at this time? All right, I have a comment I'd like to make. I'm pro-business, fiscally responsive, conservative, and I've concurred and continued with our investments to build our transport, which has been over 82 million since its inception. That investment has continued to bring prosperity and returns to our Bowling Green economy. However, it can take up to 30 years before we realize full returns on investments through our occupational tax. Occupational tax is the primary means our city pays for services to our citizens. And I, at this time, am not ready, nor will I want to raise property taxes. Our city is the third largest in the state. As Jeff mentioned, 34 cities in the state of Kentucky have a higher occupational tax than Bowling Green. In addition, our city spends less per capita than Paducah, Hopkinsville, Covington, and Henderson. And we also have a lower debt per capita than all those cities. For every dollar spent in our city, we spend 17 cents on public works, 14 cents on parks, seven cents on neighborhood and community services, 13 cents to operate our general government, and the majority, we spend 49 cents for firefighters and our police, which I fully concur is our number one priority. Since I took oath as Bowling Green's mayor, our police department has had an average of 20 vacancies in our entire police department. That weighs heavy on my shoulders, and I know it weighs heavy on each commissioner. I'm very proud of our commission. Unanimously, we approved the latest commission meeting to increase firefighter pay from 45K to 54K, and we increased our starting police officer pay from 51.5K to $60,000, which will begin on 1 July 2023. However, that approval comes with fiscal responsibility for our commissioners to ensure there's enough revenue to sustain our future and grow our police and fire departments to be sustainable for our city's rapid growth. Our city needs an additional 80 police officers and firefighters through the years 2024 to 2028. And we are projected to have almost 90 K citizens by the year 2030. Our commission of just over two years, this commission here, has opened up recently fire station number seven, and we just broke ground on a $4.2 million transport fire station number eight. And we're currently receiving bids for a Porter Pike replacement fire station and a new standalone police and fire academy. In our county city emergency operations center, all combined, that project with equipment, not including personnel, will be well over 23 million. My number one priority as Bowling Green's mayor is to ensure the safety and security of our citizens and workers, and I have witnessed those actions in spades. I firmly believe it is our commissioner's duty to work with our city management to ensure we have the needed resources to accomplish our primary mission, and if not supported, then the leader should state where the resources will come from and what missions we will no longer perform. The easy vote tonight is a no vote. Time will tell, and only God will know the truth. However, a commissioner can get this passed officially by quietly supporting a yes vote, and they can paint the appearance of not, the paint appearance of being concerned and saying no politically because their vote was not needed in order to do the right thing. A yes vote is the hardest decision that can be made. 
because it means a person is willing to do the right thing and put politics aside. As long as I'm your mayor, I will always try to do what is necessary to keep our city protected. Tonight, I support our city manager, Jeff Meisel's ask for what is necessary to sustain our city's future safety and security for our citizens. Thank you. Roll call, please. Bailey? No. Beasley Brown? No. Hill? Yes. Alcott? Yes. Municipal number order 2023-79. Municipal order approving the reappointments of Leda Becker and David Lee to the University District Review Committee. So move. A second. Move by Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner Bailey. Uh, this was a no-brainer. Two exceptional people that want to continue and be reappointed to the University District Review Committee. I wholeheartedly support their uh, reappointments. Roll call, please. Bailey? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Hill? Yes. Alcott? Yes. Municipal order number 2023-81. Do 80 first. Sorry, 80. <clears throat> it's okay. Apologies. Municipal order approving re the appointments of Dr. Dan Myers and Jill Price to the Bowling Green Audit Committee. So moved. Second. Moved by Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner Beasley Brown. Uh, these are two very smart people that have volunteered to support our audit committee. Dr. Myers has a PhD in economics. He's a WKU professor of the Gordon Ford College, and he was associate dean before that. He's gone to universities, Tennessee, Florida, and Vanderbilt. And Mrs. Jill Jackson, uh, we, many people in our community know her because she was previously a Bowling Green High School mathematics teacher from 82 to 2012, and now she is with the Department of Mathematics at WKU and a WKU grad, and she's also a mentor, counselor, and helps people uh, with their mathematics skills on the computer lab, which I had help when I was there at Western. So uh, very fond of that department. Uh, those are my two recommendations uh, for the audit committee. Okay, notice question, discussion, roll call please. Bailey? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Hill? Yes. Alcott? Yes. All right, municipal order number 2023-81. Municipal order approving and authorizing out-of-town travel expenses for Commissioner Sue Perigen to attend a legislative meeting at the Capitol in Frankfort, Kentucky. So move. Moved by Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner, did you say Beasley Brown? I'll, I'll give a brief explanation on this one. Uh, back mid-March, uh, there was a, a bill that was threatening uh, our ability to annex uh, D different things we, we have never uh, done involuntary annexation but this bill was pertaining to uh, even voluntary annexations and putting putting a, a ban on that uh, KLC was heavily opposed to this bill uh, uh, Sue is on the KLC board and so I was an, unable to go up uh, during this uh, this meeting uh, this, during this uh, committee meetings and when it went, reached the floor so Hillary uh, uh, accompanied Commissioner Perigen uh, and, and went up and met with other Kentucky City uh, representatives all across the state that were opposed to it. And so uh, they had to go up there and, and we, we make, made a good, good show and good appearance. So uh, this is just their expenses to go on that, on that overnight. I'll caveat, Sue asked me if I could do this. Kentucky League of Cities asked us if we could do this. I was teaching. Uh, Sue is our pro tem. Uh, she went up there. She fought the good fight. Um, Kentucky League of Cities says that Bowling Green has come through for them in spades. Uh, Sue went up there. She made a compelling argument. And the compelling argument is literally that if we should allow people that want to annex in communities like Bowling Green, Kentucky, that has a county government and a city government cooperatively working together, to be able to say we should make that decision locally. Um, I know we have all benefited from that. Um, and every time we have a new expansion to our trans park, we benefit from that. But just for instance, if we were not able to do the recent expansion of Envision OS, oh, AESC or Glass OI or Tyson's, which was in the county, and the county agreed, they came to us and said, we want to annex into the city, they would not have the police and fire department to support them that's necessary for those deals to go through. Um, so this wasn't understood at the certain levels, and Sue was able to get that across. And common sense came through to our legislators, and they understood 
the argument. So thank you, Sue. That was a less than $300 well spent. All right. Any other discussion? Roll call, please. Bailey. Yes. Beasley Brown. Yes. Hill. Yes. Alcott. Yes. All right. Ordinance number BG 2023. Dash seven, first reading, non-binding. Ordinance relating to budget amendment. Ordinance approving amendment number three to the City of Bowling Green, Kentucky annual operating budget for fiscal year 2023. So move. Second. Moved by Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner Bailey. Mr. Meisel. This is uh, number three, budget amendment for FY23. From time to time, we have to go back and amend budget to reflect actions that you all have taken, uh, new monies that have come in, such as grants and, and uh, uh, gifts and, and donations and all, all every, everything like that. Uh, Katie has put this together. Uh, the first part is the general fund part. Uh, the latter part is the other funds that were affected, uh, the back and forth. But uh, Katie's here can answer any questions you might have on this number three budget amendment, which will have a, a second reading next meeting. All right, any discussion for this amendment? No discussion. Roll call, please. Bailey. Yes. Beasley Brown. Yes. Hill. Yes. Alcott. Yes. Ordinance number BG 2023-5. Second like reading ends binding. Ordinance rezoning real estate. Ordinance rezoning a portion of attractive land containing 8.92 acres from AG Agriculture to GB General Business located at Zero Russellville Road, presently owned by Platinum Development LLC. So move. Second. Moved by Commissioner Hill. Second by Commissioner Beasley Brown. This was a five and Oh, vote from our last commission meeting. Is there any new discussion? No new discussion. Roll call, please. Bailey. Yes. Beasley Brown. Yes. Hill. Yes. Alcott. Yes. All right. Mrs. Jackson is going to check to see if we have any public comments. Our next scheduled meeting is May 2nd, 2023, 430, right here in City Hall. Thank you, Mrs. Jackson. All right, I have, uh, it looks like Carol Phelps. I want to come on up to the podium. Vernon Carol Phelps. And I can only write it. Well, I did, thank you. So are you Vernon? Yes, I am. Welcome, Vernon. Uh, we came here, it's been a few months before, and we basically just came here today, for, well, for two things. One of them, I still want to see some speed bumps, you know, going up and down Park, uh, Parkside Drive. But the main thing we came here for was basically to say thank you to uh, uh, the, the Officer Delaney and, and, you know, the police force in, you know, in general. We've noticed a, a substantial, you know, loss in traffic coming up and down our streets and cutting through our yards. Um, trash gone no longer having to deal with uh the vagrants banging on my door although we've got a few of them you know but every now and then it's not as bad as it was because it was on seemed like almost every other day somebody banging on your door at two o'clock in the morning you know it was getting dangerous because <laughs> the neighbors they weren't taking it and the people across the street wasn't taking it and so we're eventually something's going to happen something was going to happen i'll put it that way but now there's a big to me, a appearance of police, you know, and just riding through yeah. makes all the difference in the world. You know, they, they don't come flying down the street and go on that one end, one out the other. They come through, they stop, they sit, you know, and it makes a difference. And we appreciate that. So, you know, I think you have to acknowledge the good along with the bad, and this has been a good thing. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that. And I wanted to bring that, you know, to your attention and tell, you know, the police chief also thank you because I know it, it made a difference and he made things happen. Yes. You know, so we appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Phelps. That's kind of you. Appreciate you. All right. There's no further comments at this time. Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.